Thank you all for joining us this evening at one of the final and really exciting events offered by BCRW this academic year. Um, this is the fourth conversation in this series that we've entitled Caribbean Feminisms on the Page. Uh, as some of you will know, previous events um, in this series have featured conversations with Jamaica Kincaid, Tiffany Yannick, Edwige Dantica, and Maurice Condé. Tonight, we're fortunate to have with us Gloria Joseph and Naomi Jackson. Gloria Joseph is an activist, educator, and author who has written the novel On Time and In Step, Reunion on the Glory Road, as well as the book she's here to discuss this evening, The Wind is Spirit. She's also written numerous articles and edited multiple anthologies, including Common Differences, Common Conflicts in Black and White Feminist Perspectives, and hell under God's orders. She earned a doctorate from Cornell University and has taught and lectured worldwide in the areas of education, racism, feminism, and social justice. Dr. Joseph is Professor Emerita at Hampshire College. She lives on St. Croix. And as a personal note, I'd just like to say I'm also from St. Croix. And it was at the Women's Coalition of St. Croix, one of the many feminist social justice organizations Joseph has co-founded that I found my first job directly out of college. My time at this organization was transformative to my thinking about what is possible and what is absolutely necessary. So Dr. Joseph, thank you for your work and the communities you continue to help create. We're also joined this evening, and yes. <laughs> We're also joined this evening by novelist Naomi Jackson. Naomi Jackson is author of The Star Side of Bird Hill, published by Penguin Press in June 2015. The Star Side of Bird Hill was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and selected for the American Bookseller Association's Indies Introduce and Indies Next List programs. Jackson studied fiction at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. She traveled to South Africa on a Fulbright scholarship where she received an MA in creative writing from the University of Cape Town. A graduate of Williams College, her work has appeared in literary journals and magazines in the United States and abroad. Jackson is the co-founder of Tongues of Fire, a free creative writing workshop for queer women and transgender people of color at the Audre Lorde Project, and has served on the board of Fierce. Jackson is a recipient of fellowships from the Kelly Writers House, Hedgebrook, Vermont Studio Center, the Camargo Foundation, and Point Foundations. She has also taught at the University of Iowa and University of Pennsylvania. She is currently a visiting assisting professor of creative writing at Oberlin College. Our moderator for this conversation, as always, is Kayama L. Glover. Kayama is associate professor of French and Africana studies at Barnard College and specializes in Francophone post-colonial literature with a special focus on the Caribbean. She's the author of Haiti Unbound, a spiralist challenge to the post-colonial canon, and her current project, The Audacity of the Eye, considers narcissism and other ethics of self-care for women in Caribbean prose fiction. Kayama has translated novels by Haitian authors Franck Etienne and René Depest, and her translation of Marie Chauvet's Dance on the Volcano is forthcoming. Kayama has been the recipient of fellowships and awards from the Fulbright Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, the New York Public Library, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Please join me in welcoming our speakers this evening. So the format that we will use this evening, as always, we'll have the authors join us for a brief reading of their work, followed by a moderated conversation. And we'll ask Dr. Joseph to read first, please. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you for being here. And I'm glad to be here, with the exception of the weather, <laughs> which you all think is pretty <laughs> warm, but coming from <laughs> St. Croix, where the average temperature is in the 80s. I've had to make adjustments. <laughs> no, I don't, how much time do you say I have to read? 15 minutes? 15 minutes? Okay. 
I, I like to um, go by, you know, African time. When is the event, what time does it begin? When it starts. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it over? When it ends. But I'll be, you know, respectful of your time. So what I want to do is start by um, telling you how the book came to be. A few months prior to Audre Lorde's death in 1992, I conducted an interview with her and we discussed her biography. I promised her that I would write it and ask the question, what is it that we want this biography to do? Her response was, and this is verbatim, to leave a story of who I am in all my complexity and to make the quality of my life so irresistible that other people will share my visions. I really want people to know how hard I tried with what I have. I also want them to know that I play with toys in the bathtub and can be as stubborn as a mule, which sometimes puts me in good standing and other times not. I'm talking about enabling people to be the best that they can be, to use themselves the best that they can, and to show them, here's the way I did it. It's not a question of following. It's like a poem. And I believe passionately in the power of poetry. A poem doesn't tell you how to act and how to feel. It inspires something inside of you. So I would like my life to inspire black women, all people in actuality, in a particular way. The autobiographical part is my input. The other part of it, you have to tell, because I'm telling my part of it, and you have to tell the other part. That was, to me, a mandate given from Audrey to me. I concluded that the most effective way to fulfill her wishes would be to ask for contributors from people whose lives were impacted and influenced by Audrey's words and by her turbulent and triumphant life. I would select a wide and diverse number of people to submit materials as personal stories, dissertations, recollections, poems, memoirs, to share their interactions and knowledge of Audrey. I see the collection of, from the contributors, actually forming a profile of who Audrey, Audrey was, you see. I also see the book like a um, symphony orchestra in this sense. The contributors are the musicians, you know, violinists, oboes, drummers. I am the conductor, and it's my job to meld all the instruments into a compelling melody. Hopefully, it'll become a classic. And I see Villa Rosa Media as the producers. At this point, let me say that I'm grateful and have gratitude to Villa Rosa Media. It's a newly established and published house, a mother and daughter affair. So it's bound to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and I want to thank them because I had um, many rejections when I first um, tried to have the book published, and they were reasonable rejections. I can understand and respect each publishing house for wanting their books to represent what they feel, their philosophies. So I didn't take, you know, it wasn't a personal thing, it was just the way, the way it is. So however, the um, Villa Rosa Media did t take the risk, and um, so far it's been a, a good risk, <laughs> a successful risk. <laughs> now, um, let me see, Audrey's, um, oh, let me move on to um, the fact that there were three major memorials 
after Audrey's death. The largest one was at um, Saint, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, with over 4,000 people attending. Another one was in, in Germany, where she spent much time dealing with her cancer. And the third celebration was in St. Croix at the Botanical Gardens. And I want to read the, um, actually it was the first person who spoke at the um, ceremony. Her name was um, Reverend Cynthia Young, and here's what she had to say. Reverend Cynthia Young was also a, a, a psychic healer and a friend of Audrey's, and what she had to say as the opening comments at the ceremony. Her painful physical sojourn is over. She now resides in the city of true light and life. After her journey is over, this is Audrey Lord speaking, Cynthia, Cynthia, Reverend Cynthia Young speaking through Audrey. I shall be with many of you. From time to time, you will feel, sense, or hear from me words of comfort that are applicable to the difficult situation you shall experience. Simply think of me, and I will be there. Now, what I want to read now is briefly one of the contributors' words which exemplifies this. So many of the contributors make reference to the fact that, you know, Audrey's spirit is there, Audrey influenced them. There are several people who have told me her poem, Litany for Survival, they have on the back of their doors or the entrance, and on certain days they read it, and they feel Audrey's words inspiring them. Now, this um, section I will read is from a black, successful, truly heterosexual male who, um, <laughs> and yes, yeah, truly. Because, well, don't let me go there. And, and when I say truly <laughs> heterosexual, because most people are truly nothing, either way or the other. But <laughs> I'm getting off the subject now. <laughs> but um, we can come back to that. Now, Sam Raphael is also a very successful businessman. He owned the um, Jungle Bay Resort in Dominica, which was extremely one of the best, the best eco-tourist resorts in the Caribbean until um, a few months ago when the hurricane destroyed it, but he's in the process of building it up again. Now, there was a rally in St. Croix called um, for World Peace and Justice, and he asked Audrey to give the keynote there. At the end of the speech, Audrey asked him, um, how did he feel about the speech? And he said, because I was um, still taking it all in, I simply responded that I thought, quote, it was educational and quite informative. Well, that was the wrong answer for Audrey Lord, as if she was <laughs> insulted by my detached response, Audrey retorted, and what are you going to do now that you have been educated and informed? <laughs> she went on to elaborate that it is not enough to be informed. You must act if you want to make a difference in the world. He concluded by saying, Audrey, before I knew Audrey, my worldview on social justice had been selfish. I had only noticed the injustices that affected me directly, but had ignored the suffering of others. She helped me to connect the dots between the injustices of colonialism, economic injustice, and racism, with the struggle for justice for women and gay people. For that, I am forever indebted to her. That's just, a, to me, an excellent example of how she impacted all persons. Now let me um, conclude my um, time by reading the section on um, Audrey's um, final days in um, St. Croix. It was on the small Caribbean island 
of St. Croix, which is nine by 16, that Audre Lorde found the physical, cultural, social, okay, and spiritual home that she had always yearned for. Now this section that I'm reading is, is very critical because it represents the fulfillment of Audrey's desires as a human being. She visited many times and finally made it her home in 1988. The warm, pleasant temperatures, year-round bright sunshine, the compelling ocean, at times calm and other times roaring, and the clean air were all a welcoming balm, a relief from the stress, pollution, and noise of New York City. <laughs> and I've just recently experienced it. The other night, <laughs> when I was in the Bronx, remember Linda and this, I was reading and I heard this awful rumbling noise. I didn't know what it was. It was the L, the subway, what was it? Yeah. <laughs> I honestly did not know what that was. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Equally important and gratifying was the way she integrated into the multicultural Afro-Caribbean, Afro-American community and the way it embraced her. The community had a deep concern for her welfare and appreciated and loved her for being a dignified human being, a gracious, a gracious and warm-hearted person who was always ready to lend a helping hand. St. Croix is not free from racism, sexism, or homophobia, but being a part of the community on a small West Indian island provided Audrey with the fulfillment of many of her lifelong desires. It created a metamorphosis for Audrey, the culmination of her desire to be comfortable in her own skin. It was something that she had hungered for her whole life. Audrey frequently strolled the beaches, <laughs> reciting Jabberwocky at the top of her lungs. And the first time I heard it, I was, I looked, but she was in her element, she was enjoying it, and she enjoyed it, I enjoyed it. She loved to comb the sand, admiring the little crabs scurrying in all directions as she gathered shells. With a sense and loving look, I recalled her saying, this is like returning to my Caribbean roots, my mother's and father's roots. The beaches, the warmth of the sun and breezes, this is where I belong. The acceptance that Audrey felt in St. Croix was soul satisfying and precious. The community embraced her not based on her notoriety as a famous poet or as a poet laureate or a lesbian feminist celebrity, no. She was accepted on the basis of her warm personality, her friendliness, generosity, and willingness to be involved in local affairs. And that was extremely fulfilling to Audrey, and I'm very grateful for St. Croix that she was able to find that. There's one other area that I really wanted to talk about, and that is um, the way in which I want to um, want to and have projected Audrey in the book. You know, Audrey defines herself with, I call them those seven or eight words, you know, mother, poet, lesbian, black, African. And um, yes, she's that, but you know, thousands of women in America fit that description. And Audrey is unique. I promoted Audrey as a philosopher, a sage, a poetic genius, and a humanitarian. And I compare her, <clears throat> pardon me, to the likes of the Dalai Lama, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X. And if you think of those names and what they stand for, you know, you hear, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, his resistance, Martin Luther King, we talk about, you know, I have a dream which we're still trying to complete. And, um, as a matter of fact, with Malcolm X, um, Decima Williams from Grenada has a wonderful piece in the, in the book. And she says, she starts up by saying, if you know Malcolm and you know Audrey, and she makes, it's not a comparison, but she shows the ways in which they have, they're similar. Now, one of the reasons why I um, 
want to elevate Audrey to that status of those um, males, her name should be right there. Look at some of her quotes. Your silence will not protect you. The master's house will never, tools will never destroy the master's house. You know. Those are, you know, they're just tremendous, deep philosophical thoughts. My favorite is, wherever the bird with no feet flew, she found a tree with no limbs. Now that is so deep. That's a philosophical statement that you could use and create an entire course based on it. You know, it talks about finding your way. It talks about being able to reach a, a harmonious level despite what you may call shortcomings. That's a tremendously deep saying, and it's my favorite. Now, Audrey, um, so that's why I feel that, you know, it's our job to, and I do mean all of us, to, to promote Audrey's and her work and those sayings to the level that she deserves. The woman was a poetic genius. She had visions. Some of the things that she said way back then are coming true today. And we have to learn from her. As we know, one of the things that Audrey and I always talked about was always a learner bee. No matter how ridiculous you think something sounds, you're learning something. Even if you're learning how ridiculous the person is, you're, le <laughs> you're learning something. <laughs> so uh, my, my time is um, up. Of course, I could go on and on and on and on and on, but that's not politi politically correct. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your time. I am so honored to be on the stage with um, Dr. Joseph. Um, I, I want to tell a little quick story, which is that when I was a high school senior at Trinity School, maybe 20 blocks from here, I did an independent study, my honors thesis on black women and feminism. And I think it would not be a small thing to say that um, meeting the works of Audre Lorde saved my life. Um, and that um, there was something about being a lesbian, about being a writer, about being the child of West Indian parents who had very high um, expectations and hopes for me. Um, and seeing all that in Audrey's work and knowing that she survived um, and lived to tell the tale and inspired so many people that really made me think that the life that I wanted was possible. Um, so I wouldn't imagine that 20 years later I'd be here, um, but you know, life is funny. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna read from my novel. It's called The Star Side of Bird Hill. It's my debut novel that came out last June. It's a coming of age story set in Barbados where my mother's family is from. It's about these two um, girls, an older sister, Dion, who turned 16 in the section that I'm gonna read, um, and her younger sister, Phaedra, who's 10 when the novel opens. Um, this section is about Dion who arrives in Barbados very mad that she's been sent home. She had other kinds of plans for her summer um, and basically dealing with the reality of what is um, and some other things. Dion once had another idea entirely about how she would celebrate her 16th birthday. She and her best friend in Brooklyn, Tanisha, had their hearts set on a party hall on Church Avenue. Everybody was going to be there. Tanisha's Trini cousins and uncles and sisters, their friends from school, mostly Tanisha's, and Darren, the boy who Dion had been going with since he moved up from Jamaica three years before. Dion was drawn into the schoolyard romance with Darren by girls who said, it would be cute if y'all went together because of the way that Dion's chestnut skin played off Darren's hazelnut eyes, the same eyes that had every girl from Vanderveer to Erasmus fantasizing about Darren looking at them. As Dion got to know Darren on their bus rides home together, her affection for him had deepened, fulfilling the vain promise that had brought them together. Since she'd arrived in Barbados, Dion thought of Darren often in spite of herself, although she knew that attachment was the first step on the road to disappointment. After her father left, Dion witnessed a parade of men her mother entertained for as long as they would stick around. But while she could attract men, draw them into her web, Avril had trouble keeping them. 
In the last relationship, the one that ended the year before Dion started high school, Dion wanted to believe her mother's conviction that her boyfriend, Musa, would marry her. But something happened once her mother made for her intentions for Musa clear, and every time he came over after that, he was always just about to leave again, as if her mother's desire for him had propelled him in the opposite direction of her. By his last visit, Musa wouldn't even take his coat off. He just brought the books he promised to Phaedra, the Vogue fall fashion issue he promised for Dion, kissed their mother, and left. Dion had learned from her mother that if he wanted to keep a man, he should love you at least a little bit more than you loved him. Avril's plan to send the girls back home for the summer, announced just one week before they left, had messed up everything. The party, working at VIM to save up money for school clothes, Dion's hopes of going into the city on Saturday nights with Darren and Tanisha and her girls. So here she was in Bird Hill on her birthday, Saturday, July 16th, and as her grandmother Hyacinth would say, nothing at all goes so. There would be no DJ making special shout outs to the birthday girl, no adults hovering in the back alley, smoking joints, drinking beer, squeezing past each other to heap their plates high with curry chicken and roti skins, no girls dancing front to front on boys, winding their waists as if their whole lives had made them move this way, talking afterward about boys whose dicks had gone hard than soft on them. Back in Brooklyn, the outfit that Dion put on layaway, white jeans with a question mark and gold thread on the back pockets, a matching white top and jacket, still had $20 to go before it was paid off. Instead of wearing it, Dion was wearing the new dress her, grandma <coughs> her grandmother made for her with room to grow, a maritime number with a boat collar, white trim, heavy navy fabric. Dion thought the dress was more fit for a box of powdered milk than for a girl like her, <laughs> with legs that started just below her neck, arms made for hanging on to boys rather than pounding nutmeg, hands more fit for finger snapping than housework of any kind. Bullerman Jean was the one to whom most of the Hill women turned to get their clothes sewn and in a pinch their hair done. He owed Dion's grandmother a favor and so he gave Dion a relaxer before the party that had left her hair not quite straight. A night of sleeping in hard plastic rollers had given Dion a neck ache, tight curls that didn't brush her shoulders the way she liked, but it would have to do. A lifetime of watching her mother closely had been nothing if not a tutorial in resignation and making do. Now Dion looked around for Jean. She searched first for the elastic hairbands he wore like bracelets around his wrist, and then for his skin that was the color of a ripe plum. She wanted to catch Jean's eye so that she could register her disdain about her hair with him, but she couldn't find him in the crowd. She took note of the fact that she had never seen Jean at church or at a church function, which in Bird Hill was a way of saying she had never seen him out. The church, more than being just a place to worship the Lord, was where the fabric of the community was woven, public dramas played out and put to rest, subtle lines of hierarchy drawn and redrawn again. If the hill were a quilt made up of its families, Jean and his mother Trixie's patch was one the quilter forgot beneath her bed. The party if it was fair to call it that, was a joint one with Clotel Gums, a girl who wore glasses with lenses as thick as breadfruit skin, crinoline dresses that reached her ankles, and a mouth that seemed to open only to correct grammar or to quote Bible verse. Dion thought Clotel rather unfortunate, and though in summers past the girls played together and ran as far as the Hill women saw fit to let them, now it was clear they had nothing in common besides a birthday. Nevertheless, Clotel and Dion entered the church hall hand in hand, and both feigned surprise when the lights came up over pink streamers, balloons, and a sign that said, Happy birthday, ye children in Christ. The next day in church, the congregation would sing to them, Happy birthday, dear Christians. But on this night, both young women were glad to be spared a song as they were overwhelmed by the smell of food in the church hall. There were the legendary fish cakes women from Bird Hill were known for all over the island and which no small number of less favored women bought at the bottom of the hill on Saturday mornings. Dion could smell the yellow cakes with pineapple filling and frosting and the milk soured mouths of children who ran circles around their mothers. 
The church hall doors remained open behind Clotel and Dion. The sweet stink of the guava trees, which were planted when an ugly woman named QT died and left her small fortune to the church, wafted inside. Both girls were new to the high heels that bore blisters into their feet. Dion was painfully aware that she'd finally turned 16, the age when Avril said she could start wearing heels, and her mother wasn't there to see her wobbling or to show her how to walk in them. Dion and Clotel shifted their weight as Father Loving said an interminable prayer, during which Dion fluttered her eyes open to find the Reverend wiping his brow and studying her breasts. After his incantations, Father Loving offered them each a new leather-bound King James Bible. Clotel seemed genuinely excited to accept her gift, while Dion took hers reluctantly. She mumbled thanks to everyone for their gifts and kind words, all their variations on wishing her the best of life in Christ. Then she steeled her shoulders, readying herself for the inevitable conversations on one of two topics, books or baptism. So now that you turn 16, are you going to give your life over to the Lord in service? Mrs. Jeremiah asked, her roomy eyes taking Dion in. She clutched Dion's elbow between two firm fingers. The younger woman felt that Mrs. Jeremiah's conviction about Christ could break bone. Yes, God willing, Dion said. Her voice cracked. God's name felt like a word in a language she'd never learn. Dion looked over the jaunty red feather in Mrs. Jeremiah's hat, and her gaze landed on her grandmother and on Phaedra. She felt keenly the absence of her mother, who was in no small part responsible for her birthday turning out like this, and should, she thought, at least be there to witness the disaster. The women kept bringing more and more food and aluminum pans out to the blue flame burners, and Dion kept expecting her mother to walk through the church hall's front door. You guys still with me? Yeah. Okay. The people on the hill were Christians, and seriously so, but that didn't mean they didn't like to have a good time. Lyrics like, get something away for the Lord, were made for Bird Hill, when any news was, where any news was reason to have a party, and parties could start in the late afternoon and put the stars to bed the next morning. The Soul Train line sent women hobbling back to their seats with sweat on their brows and complaint on their lips about their old bones, the small children rubbing their eyes. Dion and Trevor, who had been keeping each other at a respectful distance until then, came together in the back of the church hall. They agreed to slip out separately and meet at their usual rendezvous location, Starside. They'd named it that because of the way the moon and stars bathed the graves in the cemetery that sloped down behind the church in light, eliminating the need for flashlights that might lead their prying eyes to their hiding place. We'll call this our special place, Trevor whispered the night they named it. And Dion, desperate for space that was not her sister's, not Avril's, not Hyacinth's, just hers, thinking he could give her what she needed, nodded. A couple hours later, when the sun had long since set and the murmurs of goodbyes filled the church hall, Dion went to find Trevor. It was hot outside, as if all the heat that had gathered during the day decided to stay the night. Sweat collected in Dion's bosom, plastering her cotton bra to the top of her dress's wide collar. She'd worn the dress all evening with an air of self-sacrifice, but now in the open air, she tugged at its buttons. She took a seat on Trevor's forebearer's grave with the gift Bible tucked firmly beneath her, making a show of trying not to dirty her new clothes. You having fun yet? Trevor asked. Define fun. Come on, Dion. You have to admit that seeing Sister B do the pepper seed was fun. Yeah, I guess you're right. Dion laughed. She remembered the older woman's shaking shoulders, the way everyone was genuinely concerned about her teeth rattling out of her mouth. What do you think his life was like? Dion asked. Whose life? His life, Trevor Cephas Loving, July 14th, 1928 to July 21st, 1973. Probably the same as my father's, baptisms, weddings, funerals, more food than you could eat in one lifetime. Same as yours. Do you want to be a reverend? I guess I never thought I had a choice. Everything in life is a choice. It's not like you just wake up one day and suddenly you're Father Loving the Third. But it's not like in the States where you just decide what you're gonna be and then you go to school and you become that thing. Here on the hill, who you are is who your people have been. 
I was born the same day my grandfather died. Everyone said that was a sign I was coming back as him. Dion felt the door close on anything substantial between her and Trevor, but then also the urgency of their closeness. Dion knew that any man whose life was already decided for him couldn't be hers. But here, where her spirit felt only halfway home, anchorless without Avril, she wanted something familiar to be close to, somewhere to land. Have you ever noticed all these people die close to their birthdays? It's almost like the earth remembers them, knows it's their time. I don't know how your mind works, Dion, but I like it. What would you do if you knew this was your last birthday? Dion turned to Trevor and whispered in his ear, Trevor was shocked that what he had been begging for all summer was being offered freely. He tried to stay cool. He placed a fiery hand on Dion's thigh and did away with her panties with the deafness and care that indicated he knew that at any moment she could decide differently. Go slow, Dion said, warning. She used her hands to guide him inside her. Trevor made love to Dion by moonlight her bare feet planted on the crumbling gravestone while he entered her with sweetness he didn't know, she didn't know he could muster. Dion remembered the roughness of Darren's hands inside her and braced herself for what Tanisha told her would feel like a pinch and then like the ocean opening inside her. She sighed, taking in the heat of him at her neck and the damp of the night air. When they were done, Dion took her panties in one hand and her new Bible in the other and let the breeze, when it came, touch her where Trevor had before. She felt wiser somehow, and looking at the church lit up above, thought that maybe this kind of pleasure could be her religion. Thank you both for your extraordinary readings and sharing. Um, so let me just explain how this will work. I will uh, ask three or four questions that I hope Naomi and Dr. Joseph will find interesting enough to answer. And um, then I will very generously cede the mic to you all. And I think we'll have a past mic go around and you can ask questions yourselves. So bear with me for a few of my own curiosities and then um, I'll open the floor. Okay, so for, for those of you who have been to any of these conversations before, you know what I'm about to ask. Um, it's about the theme of these events, or part of the theme of these events, specifically feminism, feminisms. Um, this word concept in its plurality and in its multiplicity. Naomi, I, I read one of your essays recently in which, in which you talked about the inescapability of your blackness, and I'm wondering if you can, if there's any inescapability to your femininessness um, that you would want to talk about. You'll find a better word. Um, and then Dr. Joseph, obviously, in, in, um, on time and in step, you gave activist women their very own special place in heaven in, in a very literal way. So I'm hoping that each of you will take a stab at articulating what feminism or feminisms are, is, um, and how they figure in your life beyond the page, how they intersect with other aspects of your identity, any part of that. Well, the over 30 years that I've been teaching and a few less years dealing with feminism. I guess I just brought it down to the least common denominator. I cannot understand how any woman is not concerned with the oppression of women. To me, it's as simple as that. It's just like racism. If you are not concerned about how this country and other countries uses racism as a, you know, it's, it's oppression, it's exploitation. And if you're not willing to fight against that, there's something wrong with you. You just need a, a renaissance of the psyche and you just need to be, you know, educated. It's either, you know, ignorance or denial or something. And I feel the same way about sexism. What is sexism? It's the fight against the oppression of women. It's understanding how patriarchy, the role patriarchy has played. It's so embedded in this country and men don't even realize the privileges that they have. They just think it's something that came about naturally. So when I speak about, you know, you know, feminism, it's as simple as that. You've got to be fighting against the oppression of women. Now, it can take many, you know, people can, you know, I think 
is a diversion from that basic definition. So people get, you know, lost up in all kind of, <coughs> excuse me, different types of feminism, and then they start talking about um, the um, <laughs> construction and deconstruction. You know, what are they deconstructing? Let's just deal with the basis first, the basis. And all throughout your life, if you're fighting racism, you should be fighting feminism. I see it as simple as that. When you see something, you just read a paper, you, it, it's just right there in front of your face. This is sexism. You know, America has been, you know, as, uh, the, the, the three major obsessions with, with, in the United States are money, sex, and food. And they use those three things to sell everything. And by so doing, you know, it obfuscates the real problem. So you have women advertising Viagra. Why? Because sex sells, and women, it, they use women as a sex object to sell anything. See, now I might be diverting from your question, but to me, there's no hardly, there are very few questions that are linear. When I answer a question, I have to, there are two things I do when I answer questions. One is look, look at the question through three major lens, race, sex, and class, in terms of responding to a question. The other area that I consider in answering questions is what's the intent of the question? And I learned that from Malcolm X. That's one of the things he said. He said, you know, sometimes when people ask a question, you wonder where it's coming from, and you can't answer it because you don't understand the intent. What is that person really asking? What does he really want to know? Is he showing himself off? Does he want to pontificate? Just what? So those are two you know, <clears throat> vehicles that I use in, in, in answering questions. So when it, you know, I'll just reiterate, basically, you know, <coughs> feminism should be, you know, you should be struggling against feminism in every moment of your life. And the same with racism. At least you should have to be aware of it and act upon it. If you want to bring out change, change does not come about through simple prayer and meditation. It takes action. You want your dissertation anymore on this? Uh, sure, it's got more. <laughs> um, I, 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 I definitely would take, take off from where Dr. Joseph started and say that if you're awake in America or really anywhere in the world as a woman, um, you're awake to the unfairness of our world. And I think I began as a young person to question things like, how come my cousins, when we went to Antigua, could, my boy cousins could go anywhere and we had to be chaperoned by these fools? I mean, they were two years older than us and didn't know any more than we did, um, but they were somehow in charge of us, right? Um, so from my young years, I was kind of an upstart and always getting into battles with the older women in my family and um, older men in my family and just questioning a lot of the roles um, that we were supposed to accept hook, line, and sinker. Um, and then it was only in books that I started to make sense of the structures that had created um, the things that were making me upset. Um, so it gave me a lens through which to understand the things that already upset me. Um, so um, like most things, I always begin with books to try and understand them and then move out into the world. And I certainly agree um, that prayer isn't enough and that action is really important. So beyond the page, um, I think Tammy mentioned earlier that I started a workshop with Erica Doyle, who I think I heard her laugh, um, so she's here, I think. Um, we started a workshop at the Audre Lorde Project in Brooklyn for queer and trans folks of color. Um, it was an incredible workshop that we ran for four seasons and has so many alumni who've since gone on to publish lots of work. Um, and so for me, I usually try to begin um, whatever activist work that I do with actual skills that I have. I remember going to South Africa, I was there on a Fulbright maybe 10 years ago, and someone said, you should go hold babies. And I was like, I like babies, but I don't think that's a skill set. Um, so maybe let me start with something that I actually can do, right? Um, so I'm a writer, and so to me, creating community for writers um, to do their work, whether it's fiction or political writing, um, that was my important gift to give to the world. And then um, at the time when I was on the board of Fierce, I was also working at a grant-making institution and so able to bring those resources and what I knew about raising money um, to the table. So I try to begin 
my activist work from a place of strength and passion um, and skill, um, and then take it take it from there. Yeah. I, so th there are three things, at least in what the two of you have said, that I want to follow up on. I'm going to try to keep them straight in my mind. The, f the first has to do with the connection between um, activism and writing, obviously. Um, and you made, maybe it was my fault when I said uh, your feminism's beyond the page. And sort of you made a distinction between, you particularly, Naomi, between writing and then the other activities that you've done that are, that are activists or kind of. And I suppose I'm wondering what you might be able to do, both of you, with this cluster, activism, pedagogy, poetry, power, um, the ways in which you see perhaps the simple, or not the simple, the complicated act of writing as in its, of itself being part of that fight that Dr. Joseph just brought up, that, that struggle. And then, this is a, a run on, but I'm just gonna go for it. Both of your work, and particularly in the conclusion, and I'm not gonna issue any spoilers here, but you both call on memory and pedagogy in a certain way. Um, Hyacinth talking to Dion at the end, right? Remembering the past, remembering the struggles of the ancestors and of those who are elders in life as being part of activism, pedagogy, and writing. Um, so I'm hoping you can put that, that all together um, better than I just did. Do you want to take a stab at it? Yeah, um, so I would say the, the essay that you quoted from um, was something I write, wrote for BuzzFeed last summer when my first novel came out, and I thought I would have kind of a regular debut novel, like my mom would read it, um, and some supportive friends. Um, and something a little bit more than that happened. Um, but it was interesting. There was an article um, in the Times, I think they were saying best books of summer, which was only white people. Um, and then um, there were a series of articles that called out the times for their racism. Um, and I was like, okay, this is not gonna be a regular ride um, because suddenly my book was being called forth in all these lists, you know, fighting against that. And so I wrote about that and also about Charleston and about racism in this country. And so I do think that it was a political act to write that piece. I could have certainly chosen to um, just quietly be like, well, this is kind of odd. Um, my debut's uh, novels ride in the world, but I chose to make a statement because I felt like it was important to mark the moment and what it meant to be a black writer um, in this moment and have your debut suddenly be part of a larger conversation. So I do think that there's an inescapability there. Um, and I, I, for me, I choose the responsibility as a writer to be political um, because I, I think it's important for me. I don't think everyone has to choose, choose that. Um, and then in terms of that, that specific thing, I did choose to write a whole story into the star side of Bird Hill, a, a creation story around Bird Hill, um, that it's a freedmen's community, um, that these folks suddenly find themselves free and develop it. Um, that was totally made up and it didn't have to be part of the book, but I chose to do that because I felt when I was visiting Barbados that the vestiges of slavery were everywhere and no one was talking about it. And so I felt that even if the book was set in 1989, we had all these physical markers of slavery, plantation houses, mills, um, just it was everywhere. Bussa, you know, the, the statue that commemorates um, the leader of one of the slave rebellions in Barbados, and yet there were no public conversations happening around slavery at the time, um, or even private conversations. It felt like a, a always present, never talked about thing. And so it felt important for me in my novel, even though I was writing about these two girls and the story of them and their mother and their grandmother, it felt important for me to provide a political context that um, made, made present what I felt like was constantly being pushed away in everyday life. Um, so I do think it's possible to choose to bring in the politics both in fiction and in, in my essays, yeah. Thank you. So let me start by saying um, a quote by um, Albert Camus. He said, the role of the artist is to keep civilization from destroying itself. And the second thing, um, <clears throat> when I was getting my, working on my PhD, there was a, a professor, and whenever you presented your proposal, he would say, so what? <laughs> huh. 
And, you know, he wasn't being funny. He was really, it was really a serious question. You know, you have all these fancy titles and for what your dissertation is going to be. And when he would say, so what? What he actually meant was, how is this going to impact and have effect upon what population, what people? You know, what it really is it that you are writing or doing? And it's really it's a very good question. You know, it, and the, the so what means, how is this going to, you know, impact? What good is it going to do? Who is it going to help? You see? And the same is, you know, as, as Camus said, um, the role of the writer, if you're going to keep, you know, what does it mean to keep civilization from destroying itself? Well, certainly, you know, if you look at Audrey's poetry and what she's saying, that's a perfect example of it. And um, in, 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 in writing, most of my writings have, usually have, you know, start with the, um, academic, and um, it's almost impossible for me to write anything that's not political, you see. So whatever writing, you know, I do, you know, what, what is it that, um, who am I writing for? What good is it going to do to people? I think there has to, should be a political aspect to everything that, that to most writings, of course, that's, lost to, in today's um, what sells, as my friend Opal Palmer Adisa says, you know, you can, you know, you write these sexy, steamy novels, you can make money. Or you write a how-to book and you can make money. You see, but from my, my perspective, you know, that's just all the flim-flam that America uses to divert people from the real problems, from the real questions, you know. Now, who determined what's the, what, what is the best seller and what gets promoted? You know, if you have some contacts and connections. But, the, but those of us who, you know, really feel, as Camus said, that, you know, our role is to keep civilization from destroying itself. And you can see today how it's destroying itself when you've got politicians out there talking about the, the, the wives of the people. What, well, what is that all about, you know? Where are we going? So those writers who have, you, you know, you have to have, um, it's almost like it, it, it should be, you know, internalized that whatever you write, you, you, it has to reach somebody and say something to someone. You know, it's like the um, universal, universal humanitarianism, I think, is a, is, is a bottom line, too, for writing, you know. And then you have to also consider, you know, who's your audience in your writing, you know. And who informed, how is your writing informed? Is it informed by, you know, these little quick selling novels, you know? Or is it informed by um, your, your political, your philosophy of life, you know? Your, your, your social, um, social justice, or just what, you know? What are you writing for? You just want to make some money? Anyway, these are, you know, it's just my perspective on, on, on a question. And I just feel that, that um, oh boy, <laughs> our country, you know, we, you know, we talk about democracy, it's capitalism. And by definition, someone's gotta be exploited. So th those of us who, you know, know that and been around long enough to see what's happening, I think it's very critical that, you know, our writing, whatever we do as an artist, re reflect that we have the knowledge of what is going on and we're trying to make some little indentation. And we have to do some indentation. And don't think that what you're doing is not worthwhile because, you know, in sociology, there's no such thing as a plateau. If you're not doing anything, you're going backwards. So whatever you're doing is humanitarian, universal humanitarianism, your political goals, even though you may not make the money that those persons who write those steamy sex novels or biographies of um, celebrities, you know, like it just, it just came to mind, Justin Bieber wrote a, was writing a biography. The boy, man, <laughs> yeah, these kids, they, call them, they should call them a half biography. <laughs> They're not even old enough to think straight, but adolescents don't, you know. Adolescent mind, they're not developed. They have no sense of their, their idea of consequences. It's not fully developed. There's, a, there's an example where they asked a 
people, different ages, would you roller skate down a pair of stairs? And of course the people, most of the adults said no, but the younger people, but it's a thrill of going down the stairs with roller skates, yeah, great. But they, you know, they don't see the consequence of their actions, so. Am I going off another trend? No. <laughs> That's what you're here for. <laughs> Let me pick up on something you, you brought up. Actually, both of you brought up, um, you may not have used this word, but the question of responsibility to a public. Um, and I want to add to that responsibility. In your case, Dr. Joseph, you, you mentioned Sister Lord's request that you help her voice come out in a mm -hmm. different way in a specific way for a public in a specific, uh, specific fashion. And, and both of you made me think about writing as something along the lines of speaking in tongues almost. And I wonder if you can talk more about the mandate to give voice to people beyond yourself. Obviously that's all over um, in Step in, On Time and it's also part of the Wind and Spirit. And Naomi, from a fictional perspective, I wonder if this is just me romanticizing it, but do your characters compel you to speak for them, to tell their stories? Um, or are, are they allowing you to tell a story of someone else or of yourself? So this idea of speaking in tongues and, and the responsibility or mandate to use your voice in the service of someone else or someone's else. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with a story that I, st I told uh, Dr. Joseph before we began, which was that my life changed pretty drastically in the last five years. Um, when I moved to Iowa City to go to the Iowa Writers Workshop, I left a pretty comfortable, fun life in New York City to go to Iowa, um, which is not Brooklyn. Um, and um, about a month into it, I looked up and I was like, what have I done? Um, and I wondered, like, should I go home? Is this for me? I was really, um, I was angsty. And I went to the library and I saw a litany for survival. Um, and I was, it was my version of getting prayed up before I started at the workshop and it really helped me. Um, and at the end of that movie, um, Dr. Joseph and Audrey are very much in love and in St. Croix um, and it made me feel like everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> um, that there's a life beyond this moment. Um, and while I was at Iowa, I was lucky enough to have a mentor, Sydney Mahone, who's a theater artist, another black dyke who really helped me get through um, and over a lot of the challenges of those couple years. And I was really frustrated. I was about to leave for Barbados where I was planning to finish the first draft of this book. And again, I was like, I don't know if I'm coming back to Iowa after. Um, and she said, it's not for you. This book isn't for you. You're doing it, but it's not for you. Um, and that really helped me in part because I'm an other oriented person. So I was like, okay, now I'm motivated. Um, <laughs> and um, there were a lot of people who I felt needed to read this book. It's about um, a set of young girls who have a mentally ill mother. And I felt like I had not seen a lot of stories um, in the black community that addressed not just mental illness, but also black women falling apart. Um, there's so much of our literature that's about strong black women. I didn't have that. Um, I had a couple strong black women, but my mother fell apart and I felt that that story was never told and I felt like a real weirdo growing up because everyone else had these amazing mothers and mine was a mess. Um, and so I felt that I wanted to tell that story, that that was super important to me, um, that I wanted to have a gay character in the Caribbean who, in the 80s, because um, I knew that we were there. Um, and so I wanted to write us into into the, that history and into those communities. Um, I felt like there was a, there's a, so much amazing Caribbean literature, but we need more stories about kids who grow up between the Caribbean and America and kind of ride the hyphen. Um, and this generation of young people who grow up like me, um, thinking that we're really Caribbean and then go home and are like, uh, no, you're a Yankee. Um, and so, <laughs> I um, have a nuanced understanding of why that is and the politics and privilege and all those things, but I still felt that I was um, doing some important work in terms of telling the story of our generation of young people whose parents left and our, all of our questions about what was your life like before you left? Why did you leave? What were the difficulties that you faced when you came to America? And what is it to um, experience the weight of your sacrifice? Um, and to live into the weight of their sacrifice and try and take off some of that weight along the way or to take it on and say, I'm gonna be my parents and good child. Um, so I felt that the mental illness, um, the homosexuality, the um, story of second generation and first generation Caribbean kids, I did feel a real responsibility to tell those stories. And I think 
Um, based on the reception that I've gotten anecdotally from people, I think it's working. I think that a lot of people see themselves in the stories and that that's to me the biggest um, gift. I care less about any of the other stuff, but if other people feel like um, the book brought them some healing, brought them, um, made, made a mirror to their lives, um, then it was successful. When you see speaking in tongues, what do you mean? When it's not, when, when your eye becomes multiplied and vehicles other eyes, be it Sister Lord, be it in, in, your, in your book, be it Harriet Sojourner Truth, be it Malcolm X, be it any number of people that you bring to the page and then channel their voices to a public. Because when you say speaking in tongues, you know... Not I, like, you know, speaking right. in tongues. Yes, okay. okay. <laughs> Though, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you do, but... <laughs> well, I think my age comes in. Not think, you know. My lens are different from two, three, four generations, you know. But I'm an octogenarian. And I see, you know, I have, I've seen a lot of the world. <clears throat> and a lot of um, the way people, you know, behave and perform. And I just find it necessary to target your population. For example, you, you, or if you're talking about, you know, for example, sex and sex education, you know, when I think about <clears throat> Your character being 16 and first and talking about sex. Well, today it's 12 and 13 when they're having sex, you know? I think of the, 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 the way sex in, in some segments of our population, it's, it's just it's such a wide variety, you know? And, and, and you have to speak to each segment Specifically, because you compare, for example, a 16-year-old, age of 16, a very sexual experience, and then look at the, the, the people in some cities, the guys are talking about the rainbow, meaning how many, the, the type of lipstick the girls have had on there in oral sex, well, you know. So if you're talking to that population, another population, you have to gear it to the, the, the conditions, the situations that the, the people are existing. So it, it's, um, it's, 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 it's a good question because it's difficult for me to answer. I like difficult questions because it means I have to give it more thought, you see. But um, I, I, I find it hard to have a a, you know, as if there's a monolithic response to these things, you know. And um, like when I wrote The Glory Road, there was a specific purpose in that. And that was to teach the history in a meaningful, easy way for people to, all readers, young people, old people, to understand the role that black people and other revolutionaries have played in America. So, you know, and, and I just keep thinking about, you know, the Native Americans, how they've been so mistreated and so neglected. You know, as I said one time, we need to talk about a Black History Month because of the neglect of knowledge about black history. We need a Native American month because it's just disgraceful the way the United States has treated that country. So um, I would say that, you know, you have to, categorize the writings. You have to categorize, okay, what is the purpose? Who am I reaching in, doing, in this particular writing that I'm doing? And who's gonna you know, benefit for it? Someone will benefit for it, but it's not monolithic. Oh, can I answer the, the other, your, your yes. romantic speaking in tongues question? Yes. And then we can open it up? And then we'll open it up. Um, yeah, so everyone always thinks writers, you know, the, the, the characters come to me and they speak through me. And there were certainly some moments where I felt um, spirit in the room. And I definitely don't think I did this just on my own. There certainly were like my grandmothers and ancestors who hung out with me in order to um, make this happen. Um, there was, I love to tell this story. There was a really fun moment um, in 
the summer of 2013. I had just sold the book and I had to finish it and I was really stressed out. And um, I was working every single day downtown Brooklyn at 33 Flatbush Avenue and I was taking the B41 bus home and I got on the bus and there was this woman who looked exactly like Hyacinth, who's the grandmother in this book. She had the walking stick, she was dressed in all white, she had the turban, I mean, it was as if she had come to visit me. Um, and that was the most like out of body, weird experience that I had um, while writing this book. And things did get easier after I saw her. Um, I didn't, I was too nervous. I didn't also didn't want to break the spell. What if she said something crazy? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, but, or mean, right? right? Or just like, get out of my way. Um, so that, that to me was, that felt like a blessing for the book, yeah. Well, you know, with, with the um, Glory Road that I wrote, you know, the um, Malcolm X Sojourn of Truth are taking a stroll along the um, Glory Road and they, are able to look down to a, gla a gauge that they have and see what's happening in the world below. And um, there are sections on, um, you know, education and sports, et cetera, et cetera. And in writing that book, I was told by several people that I was a medium, a medium, mm -hmm. especially for Sojourner and, and Malcolm, because I was a Malcolm X groupie and I just always been fascinated by Sojourner Truth and the things that they, say about her and um, you know I could really feel them saying what they said and even in the, the diction and the way they would say it and the same is true for Mahalia Jackson I just loved her so much I could hear her talk and when she talks to Tupac they have a conversation you know and I, I, I really felt those people and what they were saying and how they would say it, you know. So that's what makes that book so so fascinating to me and the others, that these people like, you know, with the boys and, you know, his um, fastidiousness and how he would be dressed and the, the way um, with the sports, with the athletes, you know, in athletes arena, you know, and they would be talking about the same type of racism and what was going on today. So. Yeah, in that book specifically, very definitely, I was, those people came through me, but they were the ones who allowed themselves to come through me. <laughs> Thank you, that's what I meant, of course, by speaking in tongues, but you got us there. Thank you. Um, so if we could just thank our, our, our speakers for talking to us. I just wanna say thank you for making me feel less lonely, um, it's really nice to see Caribbean women that have like, like, mind, like minds. Um, one question I had to ask was, I understand that there's like oppression outside the home on a grand scale, but I'm really focused on the oppression within the home. I was wondering if you ladies could lend me some self-care tips, especially when dealing with family members that aren't awoke to what's going on, are either in denial or ignorant to especially when you want to speak up for your people and how they're being oppressed and how you can handle that. Because in front of me, you seem very calm and I'm very angry. I have a lot of anger in me that I'm trying to channel into different, like, different ways. And it's just really hard being within a household, super Christian, no disrespect to any Christians. We all um, see God differently. Um, but I just really want to know if you ladies have any self-care tips for the oppressors within the home? I think it's a, a great question. I'm so glad that you could be in community to, tonight. I feel that, um, you know, the most terrible things that happened to me in my life happened in my house, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I was on the street and someone ran me over. <laughs> it was people who I knew and loved who, who did the worst things um, in my life. And that's not to victimize, but just to say, I hear what you're saying. Um, I think that I have a lot of compassion and patience with the people in my family that's been developed over a long time. I'm 35, which doesn't mean I'm an elder by any means, um, but I've had a long time to work through a lot of my emotions and still have work to do, but I was much angrier at 19 or 20 than I am now. 
Um, and I think that's because I've found work that really inspires me and that can channel some of that energy towards um, things that are actively making the world that I want. And also because I built a beloved community of um, friends and chosen family outside of my family. So I love my family. We're an incredible nucleus and we support each other. And I have so much more beyond that um, that gives me life. So political family, yoga family, writing family, um, academic family, um, people who I drink with. Like there's so many, um, so many layers of friendship and love that I have in my life um, that go beyond partnership even. So it's not necessarily about like, I have to find this one person who's gonna hold me down, but um, really existing within a large community of, of support um, and maintaining that. And, and being committed to maintaining those strong ties of friendship. I've lived in maybe five places in the last, last five years, and I think I still maintain those ties really strongly because it's important and it sustains me. So I think um, uh, developing, developing some patience and compassion for the people in your family is important, and to know that you're moving in spaces that allow you to see the world very differently than what they're, how they're seeing the world. And so um, some of what you're experiencing is a privilege, right? And to say, okay, um, you might not see politics in the world in the same way because you're not in college or you are working, you know, a 12 hour shift. So maybe you're not on Buzzfeed reading the latest article about transphobia. Um, and so um, just being aware of some of the privilege of, of being within an educational system, developing community, and then just being compassionate, deeply patient with the people in your life who love you, but might not understand you, you know? That was a nice response. <laughs> Mine is quite simple. Don't let other people's flaws dictate your life. You have to, as Audrey has said, you have the power, you have to know what you stand for. And if you believe in it, you have your principles and they're internalized. Don't let other, other people who are saying those things and their flaws, don't let their flaws dictate your life. It's easy to say, but it's something that you have to build up and create within you. You have to internalize your principles and know that what they stand for and you feel that they're correct and they're not harmful to others, they're helpful to you. You have to build on that strength and what these other people say, they have, they're, 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 they're flawed. I just repeat, don't let other people's flaws dictate your life. It's easier said than done, but it's something that you, that, that you have to work on. And of course, at a younger age, it's not easy to do, but it's something you have to build on and know who you are, what you want to do. Is it something that is valuable to you? Is it worthwhile? And stick with it and build on that. There are people, you know, a lot of flawed people out there and they, for all sorts of reasons, which, you know, you know, psychologists, psychiatrists, you can't cure them all. You don't know where these, the experience that they've had that make them act that way or teach you that way. And you can't expect to try to solve their problems. But you know, you can build on yourself. It, it, it's you, you're the, you're the person that's gonna be facing the world. I'm interested in how Afrofuturism is connected with black liberation and how, we, how dreams um, evolve into like our identity and memory. But I think for me, I'm more interested right now of thinking, well, I'm in the gist now of thinking about going to grad school, but I'm Caribbean and I'm interested in Caribbean um, women studies, but I'm in the space of like, where can I locate Caribbean feminism? Where we all come from various islands and various identities. So I think now I'm just looking at programs and just wondering what program fit within this understanding of Caribbean feminism and what does that mean? Are you familiar with, with CAFRA? No. It's the Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action. No, I'll write that down later. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been going on for years. All right. <clears throat> At one time, it was very viable. It was, it's called CAFRA, Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action. And for the Caribbean women to take that stance at that time, that was a bold and wonderful thing that they did. 
the, the organization had representation, representatives from throughout the Caribbean, and I was a represent, representative from St. Croix. And um, they took on, you know, the, the project they um, were involved with, of course, were basic, similar to what feminist problems were about, you know, domestic violence or related, some of them, of course, would be specifically related to the particular island that the people came from. You know, with the, um, I remember once with the, um, laws about selling and bananas, et cetera. Anyway, it was a really interesting case because the public would have no idea what these women were going through with their selling, with, with having to make the produce and make a living out of it. And um, so that's an organization, you know, I still can still put on. Opal, do you know, do you want to say something about CAFRA? CAFRA was based and still is based in Trinidad. Trinidad. And it has representative um, <coughs> from all of the Caribbean islands. <coughs> and certainly, you know, in terms of feminist study and feminist discourse, people in the Caribbean who have been at the forefront of that are people like um, Rhoda, um, who is also in Trinidad, Patricia Mohammed, you know, Carol Boyce Davies, also from Trinidad, um, Carolyn Cooper in Jamaica. So. Um, while there is not necessarily a definitive, definitive feminist discourse from the Caribbean, Caribbean scholars and writers and critics have been um, establishing tenets around Caribbean feminism and the issues that are important to women, working class women and others in the Caribbean. And certainly a group such as Sistrin that in, in Jamaica that I'm very much familiar with and Hannah Ford Smith, um, who started theater as a way of helping working class women to look at issues of domestic violence and those kinds of things. Those organizations and those uh, scholars have been around and continue to articulate and um, give presence to Caribbean um, feminist theory. Yeah. Also, in, in the 80s, um, Dr. Janetta Cole and I did a um, photographic essay. I was a photographer and she did the writing. It was called The um, Caribbean Women, The Impact of Race, Sex, and Class. And we traveled throughout the, in pretty much the entire Caribbean. And I'll see, when you talk about activism, doing things, it would be, it would be great if, if you, young lady, <laughs> actually did a follow-up on something like that, because what we found at the time was the, um, <laughs> the Caribbean women, they practically didn't want to have anything to do with feminism, so after a couple of days, we realized, don't use the word feminism, but some of the things that they were interested in, what they were doing, were based on the same principles of, you know, of feminism in the States. The other thing at that time, they wanted to know why we call out, why you call yourself black? You're not black. You know, so we learn to, um, you know, alter our comments and our ways of being. But, uh, you know, that, that study was very insightful in terms of the, um, for example, the women would say, um, oh, we don't have no problem with men dominating us. We're all the, pr we're principals in schools. We, do, we can do this, we can do that without understanding patriarchy. They just took it for granted that men could do certain things and they felt that if they could, um, raise their products and sell them in the market and argue and do what they had to do, that that gave them, you know, a, a sense of, of um, being not oppressed. See, they didn't, weren't able to separate the immediate situation where they were the dominant ones from the fact that the patriarchy was still ruling. You know? So it, it, it's important to, to, for the young people to keep things like that going. Find out what's happening in the Caribbean. Find out what's going on, you know? Especially now with Cuba. Yeah, I would say um, from Barbados, um, as I have to shout out those folks, uh, Tanya Haynes at the Code Red um, for Gender is definitely something you should be looking into. And you didn't ask about queer stuff, but I think it's connected. Um, be Glad is a new um, LGBT organization in Barbados and CAISO in Trinidad. 
Um, so there's a plenty going on of our generation. There's a lot of really amazing Caribbean feminists all over doing really good work and the internet is your friend. Um, and uh, once you start with Kaiso and Code Red and um, be glad you'll, that rest, everything else will be illuminated. Um, and I would say too, like in terms of looking for programs, we're everywhere. I mean, I think I'm a creative writer and so maybe people would say, oh, that's not a Caribbean feminist program or something like that. But I don't know that you have to be so specific about um, thinking about that, more think about what you wanna do and what's the program and institution that's best gonna serve that. If it's an institution, it might not be. I'm studying abroad in Jamaica this summer for one month and I'm gonna be working with the Alpha Boys and taking two classes at the University of the West Indies. So I just wanna know if you have any advice for me of like how I can help the community or any ways or what, what should I expect, you know what I mean? I don't know as much about what's happening in Jamaica, but I have a feeling there are several people in the room. Could someone raise their hand who <laughs> knows about what's happening in Jamaica right now? Any Jamaicans in the room? Opal <laughs> is one. Um, there's another here. There's three people who have identified themselves. I don't know that you should be, you're there for a month. I, I think this whole um, American thing of helping, like leave that at the door. I yeah. think you should think about learning. And um, <laughs> you're only, I wouldn't go with the intention of like, how many houses can I build or how many babies can I hold? Or I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, no, being, I'm joking, I'm joking. No, 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 I'm, I'm not teasing you. I'm doing a service learning project, so I, that's kind of Yeah, cool um, well. but I think just think about, talk, connect with these women and ask them what's cool and what you should be looking for rather than like, how can I help? Yeah, I have one more question. Yeah, sure. Um, like when people tell you, because I, I identify as a feminist, so when people, like tell me like, oh, like that's not cool or like something mean against it or against it, what, you, what advice would you give me to like say back? It's, it's hard to be unpopular, right? Um, <laughs> it's, it's just a hard way to be in the world. That's the joy of the struggle. Excuse me? That's the joy of, that's the, the, struggle. Joy of the struggle, Dr. Joseph that's says. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna go with that. That's the joy of the struggle. You're gonna figure it out. It won't bother you as much as you, and I hate that. I hate that your particular generation that suddenly is no longer cool to, not that it was ever cool to be feminist, but particularly um, the 18 to 24 range seems to struggle with that. I hate that, but you're gonna, it, it won't bother you as much. Um, I wanna thank our speakers and our moderator for coming and joining us.